Let's talk about half a mil and specifically what really happened to half a mil. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, half a mil was an MC from Brooklyn, Crown Heights, Albany Projects to be exact, and he repped the Gapia and he most definitely repped the firm. Um, so if you lived in New York, the time of his unfortunate demise, you remember that the news reports reported his death as a homicide and you know they said he was murdered and then you fast forward 15 years later present time everyone claims he committed suicide so uh the weird thing is that you know the news reports don't seem to exist anymore uh you could go online and you can't really find any concrete evidence or proof that that's the case and uh most of the information you find is just anonymous posters you know trolls um people whose stories don't coincide one person will say you know i was there yeah i remember that day i've jumped off the roof it was crazy and then the next person will claim that they knew him and that you know um he shot himself in his own apartment then you got the conspiracy theorists who claim that the government allegedly killed him because uh half of him was kicking too much knowledge um now half was definitely kicking that shit Half, uh, his content was really interesting, mainly because he was around, like, um, I guess early to mid-90s was when he started. Mid-90s, uh, people really started to take notice of him, but mid-90s, late-90s, early 2000s, and a lot of the content in his rhymes, uh, it, it was just different from what everyone else was talking about. Now, you know, you could fast forward a little bit and in the 2000s, you know, and later, uh, you had a lot of artists, you know, like a, an immortal technique, let's say, for example, but just a lot of artists like that who sort of started their own kind of like subculture in hip hop with conspiracy type of rhymes and being more open minded to alternative information and things of that nature. But, um, you know, that that's a uh, great and all, but it, it comes off more like um they just sort of regurgitate info that is easily accessible because of the internet like almost you think like okay they'll just watch like alex jones and then sit there and pen a verse and it's basically the exact same thing he just said uh with half though you know half was doing this specifically like the mid 90s where you know the internet wasn't really a thing yet uh not like that at least and you know, Half was just very wise, very prophetic, very intelligent, and he was pretty much warning us about the world we live in today. So, um, to say, you know, they wanted him gone, um, I don't know. I don't know whether I could believe that or not, but I, I could get that point. And, um, you know, I just hate that, that term, too, conspiracy theory and, you know, conspiracy theorists and this and that. It's like, it's an easy way to put someone in a box. Um, and just separate people and if you're in that box you're crazy and everything you think is crazy and uh, you're mixed in with a lot of uh, shit that is pretty crazy it's not a uh, there's no gray area there's no middle ground and truth is that there's truth and lies in everything so it's best to keep an open mind do your own research uh, and form your own opinions come to your own conclusions and determinations and um, but Anyway, there's a lot to get into, so let's get right into it. So, uh, salute to Doggy Diamonds. Uh, if you're not subscribed, subscribe. Doggy Diamonds TV, Forbes DVD. Uh, Doggy Diamonds sheds light on a lot of artists who unfortunately don't have that platform anymore um, to, you know, talk about their career, the, the industry, um, a lot of things that people wouldn't know otherwise so anyway he recently interviewed uh, Ali Vegas and Bloodsport and now Ali Vegas uh, used to collaborate with Half a Mill pretty much like I guess like late 90s early 2000s uh, Bloodsport was more probably like a closer friend to him but um you know both close to him and both shed light on a lot of things that that um you know I didn't know about and it sort of changes your whole point of view when you find out so um, I mean one interesting thing they both mentioned was that no one from the firm showed up to have funeral and you know you may have wondered I know I did over the years like why doesn't have get more love why why does anybody ever mention him there's no tributes there's no nothing and 
you don't know you know you really don't know you could only uh, guess as to why that would happen you know some people are just forgotten a lot of people are just so driven and focused on their own careers that they won't even care enough to take time to show love to uh, someone who passed away but um, when you find out that no one went to his funeral it sort of gives you a different point of view on what might have been the case uh, with the egos involved jealousy probably both uh, you know I know AZ he had like a tribute track to half but even that was kind of cryptic um, so most people didn't even know who he was talking about and you know the reasoning behind that is that supposedly you know they were saying basically that uh, if you know half did kill himself that it was considered that suicide is considered like a cowardly act according to uh, God body principles and you know that's just crazy to me because that's somebody that you rock with for years um, and you gonna do him like that, you know? Um, you know, no one knows for sure exactly what did happen to him, but um, but yeah, but I don't know. That's pretty crazy to me. You know, how do you look at suicide? Cause um, you know, I don't, I don't think I know anybody who hasn't contemplated suicide at some point in their life. You know, some people more than others, and uh, uh, I'll say this: like, you don't really know what's going through the mind of someone who does kill themselves, because obviously you haven't killed yourself if you're here listening to me and I haven't if you know I'm saying the things I'm saying so how are you gonna judge somebody for doing that you know you don't really know where their mind was at um, you know me personally you know I've been there and I'm grateful that I never did go through with it and and that's why it kinda does hit you in a certain place cuz you know that could have been you easily um, but I mean, me personally, like my my reasoning behind it, like I, I don't know, I was kind of a wild dude back in the day, and I I was uh, I, it was kind of dangerous for anyone that was around me, and that's the way uh, I sort of convinced myself that, you know, I like I'm a detriment to everyone around me, and I would be doing them a service by killing myself, you know. Which uh, looking back, I mean, maybe there was some truth to that, but um. You know, I'm thankful I didn't, but that that's why I say, like, you don't really know what's going through somebody's mind. So con to consider that cowardly, like, that's about as selfless as it gets, like, to take yourself out to protect everyone else around you. I don't know, but different circumstances for different people, so I don't really know, um, you know, what his reasoning was. But that's also why I'm not so quick to judge. Um, and, you know, with funerals... Um, People look at funerals differently. I know personally, uh, for me, you know, I hate funerals. Um, I just hate a lot of, like, the ritualistic stuff that we uh, do just as human beings. And um, we don't really question things. We just do them because they're done. But the, the last thing I would ever want, um, you know, when I'm gone, uh, is uh, the first thing you do is just stick my corpse in a box and then what, go through my phone, call everyone I ever knew, call everyone you ever knew and essentially host this party you know and my corpse is the centerpiece and everybody's you know coming to look at my dead body I, it's just weird and you know I'm sure there'll be a lot of fake love and pity and, and there'll definitely be a lot of real love too don't get me wrong but it, it's you know let the people that were closest to me mourn and go through the emotions and stages that they go through you know after dealing with something like that Last thing I want them to do is to host some party for for people that probably weren't anywhere near as close to me as you know the people who were close to me were. So it's weird. I get the whole you know paying respects and as much as I hate funerals, you know I do go to them. So for the simple fact to pay my respects and and uh, but at the same time I understand if somebody doesn't like funerals doesn't go to funerals but that's not the only way you can pay your respect so you know for the firm doesn't seem like they paid their respects at all or, you know I, I mentioned them because they barely mentioned him and just doesn't make sense to me uh, you know a lot of those comments too they they really uh, just bother me just people jump out the window with things that just aren't true you know you can uh, you could argue, well, half a mil wasn't part of the firm, and um, you know he wasn't an official member when the the that album dropped. 
but no one really knew who was an official member until the album did drop. You know, it, it was a lot of stuff was up in the air, and for the two years prior to that album dropping, Half a Mill repped the firm as hard as anybody. Uh, he was all over the mixtape scene, like I said, and uh, you know, he was repping for them. He he was, uh, and they they were repping for him too. You know, so. You know, I like to deal in facts, so the things I'm saying, you know, you could go back and fact check. Um, you know, of course, the the original four members of the firm, Cormega, Nas, Foxy Brown, and AZ. And uh, then, you know, there was that classic freestyle uh, clue tape. It was uh, Nas, Femme Fatale, and Nature. And, you know, that was the one that had Steve Stout in the intro. And Nature just went in on Mega, you know, just sort of rubbing in, taking his place. And that's why everybody found out, like, wow, I guess Nature replaced Mega. But the firm roster was always sort of, uh, you know, mixed. And you don't really know who was, you know, in it and who wasn't. You know, there was another Clue tape. I think it was uh, Just Cruising. It was one of those R&B tapes. And they had a track. Uh, it was like Nas, AZ, and Nature. And the song was called, like, Welcoming Mary J. Blige to the Firm. So clearly she was supposed to be a member. Um... She collaborated with them, you know, a couple of mixtape cuts, but I guess that never uh, materialized into anything. You know, she was never uh, part of the group when the album dropped. And same thing with Nori. You know, Nori collaborated a lot with them. And same thing, you know, it's them with the shout outs, you know, the firm, firm this, firm that. Uh, you know, Nas too. I remember him running down, like, the roster. You know how they give shout outs before or after a freestyle. And Nas basically. You know, listing off the names of everyone in the firm, and of course, you know, half a mil. So, uh, half was on the album, you know, so was Nori. So, they were close affiliates, if nothing else. And with half, too, he was also, you know, they had that uh, single, and uh, B side to the single was the world famous remix. And half had the first verse on that, you know, he set it off, and that was one of those tracks that they used to perform when they were promoting the album. So, a half was, you know, touring with them definitely rock with them so to say I've just did one song with them for their album it's uh not really the case you know and uh when you say things like that it kind of makes me think you don't even know what you're talking about and you weren't in tune with anything that was going on around that time but so back to the Doggy Diamonds interview uh, another thing that Bloodsport mentioned basically he shouted out Tony Touch and he was saying shout out Tony Touch he was one of the only DJs who showed half love uh, and definitely shout out Tony Touch uh, mixtape legend you know one of the greatest mixtape DJs of all time um, half basically uh, AZ brought him along uh, like I think I'm pretty sure AZ brought half to the firm and um, you know he brought a he brought half a mil to um, you know, Tony Touch had that 50, uh, 50 MC series, and uh, Easy and Half killed it. You know, Quiet Money, uh, repping Quiet Money, and and um, you know, classic, classic. Uh, look it up if you have, if you never heard it. But but he basically, you know, Bloodsport singled out uh, two DJs in particular who didn't show Half Love, and he said DJ Clue and Funkmaster Flex, and you know, I don't know how true either of those things were. I could just go by what I know and what I remember. So, uh, I know for a fact, I remember Clue had uh, the, the Ruler's Back mixtapes, part one and part two, and half appeared on both of those. And they weren't just, you know, the firm tracks. It was half solo tracks. You know, he I, I think they were like collaborations too, but, um, you know, half a mil tracks. So, he showed him some love. You know, he definitely showed the firm love. He def you know, half wasn't on every clue tape, that's for sure. So maybe he thought he, he could have uh you know, showed more love. I don't know, but you know, with Flex too. Remember on Hot Ninety Seven, um you know, that world famous remix, like I said, that was a big hit for them. Uh great track that catered to all audiences, you know, uh it was kind of a mainstream type of beat, but fire and you know, they all killed it. Half, of course, had the first verse, and, you know, Flex used to drop bombs on it. He used to bring uh, Half's verse back over and over and over again. Um, now, if you meant, like, Flex's mixtapes, then I agree. You know, Half definitely wasn't uh, appearing on those. So, but, I, you know, I just want to say, like like I said, I was heavy into mixtapes back then, and there were a lot of DJs that showed Half Love. Uh, DJ Cool Kid, probably the most. He was on so many Cool Kid tapes. Um, you know, Lazy K... 
K Slade. There was a lot. There were a lot of DJs at that time. DJ Juice. And it just kind of showed you too that you know half of Mill's work ethic, um, half was grinding hard at that time. You know he was popping up all over the place, and you know it wasn't just mixtapes. Uh, you would also catch him, um, you know, on the radio. And I mean, if you didn't know who Half a Mill was at that time, like I don't know where you were. You know, um, maybe you were just listening to Hot ninety seven. You know, Biggie, Jay Z on repeat, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But the beautiful thing about the '90s was that you had so many alternatives, and you you didn't have to be force fed the same shit on repeat all day, every day. Um, you know, you could switch over to the underground stations, and of course, you know, people remember in the '90s they were like the college radio stations. Uh, you know, WKCR, 89 Tech 9, uh, of course, Stretch and Bobito, legendary, legendary show, um, but when you, you know, you could also switch over, WNYU, you know, 89.1, uh, DJ Riz, you know, Mayhem and Sunset, and, uh, you know, you would tune in, and you would just hear half a mil just tear shit down, man, he used to have so many legendary freestyles, uh, Man, just unbelievable. That was just a great time in hip-hop, especially uh, underground hip-hop in New York City. Uh, I'd say Half was like one of the main standout MCs. Uh, also, you know, Natural Elements, uh, just a, a crew from, um, it was like one, you know, L. Swift, I think from the Bronx, Mr. Voodoo from Brooklyn, and uh, A. Butter from Manhattan. And, uh, that, you know, they had like original members back Back in the day, they switched it up a little. Charlemagne, the real Charlemagne. Not, I don't know who this dude is running around. And uh, everyone's giving him attention. But Charlemagne was their producer. And, um, you know, there's just like a sound in hip-hop that, that uh, just doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, a lot has to do, too, with, like, the equipment. Um, you know, production changed. Uh, we used to have, like, the SP-1200s where you would have that classic, that New York sound, that boom bap. The, those thick drums, uh, bass lines, and, you know, once they switched to NPCs, beats changed, uh, I'd say probably like around 98, things really took a turn for the worse, it was still good, don't get me wrong, but it was different, and um, I'd prefer for there to be sort of like subgenres rather than one replacing another, but, uh, but that's a story for another day, and uh, basically, you know, I say that to say there's just that, that half... Um, he was just killing shit at that time, and if you were listening, you were saying to yourself, like, these are the, they're next up, you know, they're, they're clearly, uh, stars, and, and it's just weird that half a mil never really blew up, there's been sort of like a resurgence over these past few years of people who've gained an interest in him, and, which is kind of weird, um, considering he's been gone for so long, um, I know I have definitely had a fan base back in the day, but it was significantly smaller. Um, but I, I mean, that's a beautiful thing. Definitely discover everything you can, you know, from him. He left behind just a, a great catalog of music. And, um, you know, that's the thing with, with hip hop and music and just artists in general. Uh, one of, one of the great things about that you know when you are an artist and you pass away um you know you leave a legacy behind and your music will live on forever and in hip-hop we usually celebrate artists you know it's usually the people that are closest to the artist that make an effort and you know you could look at like let's say um you know big pun for example uh, you know, Fat Joe, Cuban Link, say what you will about them. You know, I respect both of them, uh, both incredible lyricists. And, um, you know, forget saying what you will about them, just, you know, you respect the fact that they're constantly mentioning Pun, they're constantly just sharing stories with about him, you know, with us, and, uh, you know, doing tributes for him, and... Just keeping his name alive, um, you know, when we do that with artists, 
could say like half wasn't as popular, but um, which is true. But like we celebrate our artists, you know, from the big to the small, you know, uh, no pun intended, but but from you know the popular artists to the not so popular artists, we just um, show them that respect because that's the least we can do. So you know, like I said, yeah, like Biggie Smalls, Pac, they still have movies coming out today. And they've been gone a lot longer. Um, you know, Big L constantly, new mixtapes coming out. Uh, you know, but not new material, but uh, never heard before material. And, and it's just people in his camp that uh, that want to do something special for him to keep his legacy alive. So with half a mil, you just don't see that. And it's a, it's a shame um, considering how much love he showed to all of them and how much he repped for them uh, to not see it reciprocated. And so, I mean, you go back to that, to the, the Doggy Diamonds interview, and, um, you know, you find that out, that they didn't go to his funeral. It, it just, like, none of them, you know? So, uh, I was saying before, you know, I don't really believe in funerals, and I know a few people that are like-minded, not many. So, um, I'd get it if it was, like, one or two of them, but all of them didn't show up. It, that's just weird to me, and it seems like just a, a you know, conscious, unanimous way to say fuck him which is weird um you know that was your man and uh i don't know but uh but i would have to hear that out their own mouths um you know that's a pretty strong accusation uh you know to consider someone a coward you know who died and everything and uh i don't know so that that's maybe a question for you know an interview if you were to have an interview with any of those individual members so going back to the interview with Doggy Diamonds and of course uh, the Half Mill documentary, uh, another important thing to note that Bloodsport said was that that the documentary was for promotional use only. In other words, no one got paid. And I mean promotional use only, you have to wonder, you know, what were they trying to promote? Uh, the notion that half committed suicide. You know, the documentary wasn't promoting his album because his album dropped during the documentary. So to release that after the album dropped, like, that just doesn't even make any sense. That would be something that would come out beforehand. You know, so what are they trying to promote? And and you, you look at uh, the person who shot the documentary, you know, all that information is public. You could look up her information, her resume and everything. Um... You know, it's a woman. She's not even from New York uh, or the surrounding area. She's from the South. Now, what would make her to decide to uh, come all the way out to Albany Projects in Brooklyn and do a documentary on an underground rapper, half a mil, who, you know, unless you were in tune, you really wouldn't even know who he was. Uh, and, you know, this was back in the day, this isn't, um, you know, Hipsterville, USA, uh, you know, this new Brooklyn where you got weirdos on unicycles with, uh, handlebar mustaches riding around like shit's all good, you know, this was back then, different environment, uh, you know, I say that to say this, like, she, she was good because Half said she was good, you know, he took care of her. He respected her, and uh, he allowed her to do the documentary. Now, uh, the documentary itself, you know, it was great just to see Half, uh, to see him performing, you know, some of his songs, uh, to see him on an everyday basis. You know, a lot of interesting scenes. Got to see Half uh, in his everyday life, you know, on the corner, hustling uh, with his people, dealing with the pressures of the industry. And now one of the weird things in the documentary is that there's a lot of interviews with different people and it seemed like, you know, literally after every time they interview someone, boom, you know, jumps to a cutscene and it says R.I.P. the person we just interviewed. And I mean, this just happened nonstop throughout the documentary. So, I mean, if you're from the hood, you could say, yeah, that's everyday shit. But uh, that, like to that degree, it was just a little weird and um, a little off-putting. So... Uh, like I said, I, li I like the documentary just for the fact that um, to see the footage, um, that was just very different, and you got that from his music. 
Um, but to see him too, just sort of added to it. He just had um, this sort of this demeanor that um, just knew too much maybe. Um, like I said, very wise, but also very, very calm. And um, I don't know, just the type of person um, that you wouldn't see, you know, often themselves. And, uh, you know, you could say, what type of person is that? And you would be right, you know, what type of person is that? But, I mean, I say that more in the fact that, like, you know, I've just had uh, too much going for him for me to believe he would do something like that. You know, he had so much promise and um, just had a, a, just a legendary work ethic. Like I said, you know, he was all over mixtapes, uh, the radio, you know, he was popping in. And I, I mean, that era, you did it for the love, you know, no one was paying you for that. So he was just grinding hard to get his name out there and, uh, you know, to kill himself before he could reap the, the benefits of it is um, it's just a little weird. And it didn't just does not seem like something he would do. And the fact that there's so many people that don't buy it, um, you know, makes you ask yourself. It makes you ask yourself why. Um, why would there be so many people? And and I mean, you could say, oh, you know, people just don't want to accept that someone died. But um, you know, it just doesn't seem like that's the case. But so with the documentary itself, uh, the documentary was just very, very, very slow. Um, there's just so little going on and uh out of nowhere the documentary just ends with the final you know rest in peace type of cutscene where just says half killed himself the end and you're like what like that's it you know uh no information no explaining what happened i mean it's a documentary like if you're gonna do a documentary in someone's life you would think you're going to explore the whole person's life as well as their death, you know, and you didn't get anything as far as like half a mil's childhood. You just sort of jump into uh, present day half the artist and that's fine and all. But uh, like I said, half looked out for her and her crew and, uh, you know, they were good because he said they were good. And if he was to, to die, you know, you'd think that they'd give him that respect to to explain what happened, investigate what happened, uh, you know, even link something at the end, like, if you want to, you know, donate to his family, like, half had a wife, he had a kid, he had a kid on the way, uh, which is another reason, too, I, I can't imagine uh, he would kill himself, but, you know, like, he, he did this, what, for promotional use only? It seemed like everything he did was for promotional use only back then, um, so, damn, give him that credit. Or at least, you know what? Instead of just having some text that says, like, rest in peace. I mean, look, look us in the eye. You know, look in the camera and tell us that he killed himself. It's just all weird to me. Uh, another thing Bloodsport mentioned is that the, the woman conveniently decided to never do another documentary again. Because uh, I think the reasoning was that... Um, you know, all the deaths sort of freaked her out or whatever. Um, which is understandable, but... At the same time, why didn't you stop after the first couple, you know? Now everyone is dead and now, um, I don't know. It's just uh, just weird to me. And it's weird to me that no one questions that, you know? How does someone just pop up out of nowhere and do this, supposedly a documentary on all these people? Everyone dies and then they disappear off into the sunset. That's weird. And, uh, you know, I say allegedly a lot and allegedly with everything I'm saying. Because, yeah, you know, I don't want to accuse these, you know, someone of, uh, of like, some grand conspiracy and someone being hired to, you know, uh, aid in the death of, you know, a mass amount of people. But uh, all I'm saying is um, keep an open mind and um, just look at everything that went on and what was going on. Uh, the reasoning behind a lot of things didn't really make much sense, you know, and the fact that, uh, like, you know, I mentioned the firm before, you know, how does not one of them show love? It's almost like he, he was, they decided to, you know, erase him from the history books, you know, so you could pretend he never existed, but he did exist, and he did leave a catalog of music behind, and you can't kill that. You know, and if you do want to remove 
everything there'll always be someone else that'll you know put it back up and uh and it's just weird that um fans you know who never even knew him show more love to him than the people who actually did um you know and and shout out to those people there's just like well i mean there's very few but like a handful of youtube channels that'll consistently you know upload um just like old classic stuff from half uh and they do you know attempt to keep his name alive so again salute to them and if you weren't familiar with half and all definitely just look him up you know there's so much to go through um but yeah the, the, you know there's a lot of questions and not many answers and for someone who is as nice as half a mil it's just weird that um he doesn't get that credit he deserves his his uh you know his name is barely mentioned and you have to ask yourself why um uh I mean, even going back to the documentary, you know, there were some things that you could you could jump to your own conclusions. There were a lot of things going on, especially towards the end. You know, I'm not really going to touch on that. Like I said, you could you could make your own uh, determination as to what you think happened, and you know, decide for yourself. But um, but you know, let me know what you think, and and let me know what you know. Um, you know, I just feel like it's it's important to talk about these things, and you know, the more information, the better. Um, you know, I loved Half a Mill. I didn't know him personally, uh, just respected him as an artist, and followed him throughout his career. Or just uh, just never really understood how he didn't blow. He was definitely ahead of his time, and uh, maybe that's the reason why people nowadays seem to be you know taking an interest in him more than they did back then and he did have a fan base but uh it doesn't seem like it was as big as it is nowadays but i mean even now you know it's not probably not as big as it should be um you know he sort of he had something for everybody he had that that it factor too so just don't get it you know yeah he had the the you know commercial type hits the the underground really really gritty type of shit that that uh you know and just the way uh he put his words together uh you know a uh, very unique and very uh abstract thought process like that went into not even just the way he wrote his rhymes but his freestyles his freestyles were nicer than a lot of dudes written um uh, man yeah uh, those like wnyu freestyles you know go back look them up if you haven't um just incredible but uh you know rest in peace to half a mil um continue to keep his name alive uh because that's all we can do and you know let, let's let's keep asking questions because that's the only way you're going to get any answers so you know thanks for listening and that's it for today peace